This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lottie Clare, Lottelita.LiveJournal.com. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 25 The Little Countess. Cheerful as my godmother naturally was, and entertaining as, for our sakes, she made a point of being, there was no true enjoyment that evening at La Terrasse till, through the wild howl of the winter night, were heard the signal sounds of arrival. How often, while women and girls sit warm at snug firesides, their hearts and imaginations are doomed to divorce from the comfort surrounding their persons, forced out by night to wander through dark ways, to dare stress of weather, to contend with the snow-blast, to wait at lonely gates and stiles and wildest storms, watching and listening to see and hear the father, the son, the husband coming home. Father and son came at last to the chateau, for the Count de Bassompierre that night accompanied Dr. Breton. I know not which of our trio heard the horses first, the asperity, the violence of the weather warranted our running down into the hall to meet and greet the two riders as they came in, but they warned us to keep our distance. Both were white, two moving mountains of snow, and indeed Mrs. Breton, seeing their condition, ordered them instantly to the kitchen, prohibiting them at their peril from setting foot on her carpeted staircase till they had severally put off that mask of old Christmas they now affected. Into the kitchen, however, we could not help following them. It was a large old Dutch kitchen, picturesque and pleasant. The little white countess danced in a circle about her equally white sire, clapping her hands and crying, Papa, Papa, you look like an enormous polar bear. The bear shook himself, and the little sprite fled far from the frozen shower. Back she came, however, laughing and eager to aid in removing the Arctic disguise. The Count, at last issuing from his dreadnought, threatened to overwhelm her with it, as with an avalanche. "'Come, then,' said she, bending to invite the fall, and when it was playfully advanced above her head, bounding out of reach like some little chamois. Her movements had the supple softness, the velvet grace of a kitten. Her laugh was clearer than the ring of silver and crystal, as she took her sire's cold hands and rubbed them and stood on tiptoe to reach his lips for a kiss, there seemed to shine round her a halo of loving delight. The grave and reverend signor looked down on her, as men do look on what is the apple of their eye. Mrs. Breton, said he, what am I to do with this daughter or daughterling of mine? She neither grows in wisdom nor in stature. Don't you find her pretty nearly as much the child as she was ten years ago? She cannot be more the child than this great boy of mine, said Mrs. Breton, who was in conflict with her son about some change of dress she deemed advisable and which he resisted. He stood leaning against the Dutch dresser, laughing and keeping her at arm's length. Come, mamma, said he, by way of compromise, and to secure for us inward as well as outward warmth, let us have a Christmas wassail cup and toast old England here on the hearth. So, while the Count stood by the fire, and Paulina Mary still danced to and fro, happy in the liberty of the wide hall-like kitchen, Mrs. Breton herself instructed Martha to spice and heat the wassail bowl, and, pouring the draught into a Breton flagon, it was served round, reaming hot, by means of a small silver vessel, which I recognized as Graham's christening cup. "'Here's to old Lang Syne,' said the Count, holding the glancing cup on high. Then, looking at Mrs. Breton, "'We twa ha paid lady the burn from morning sun till dine, "'but sees between us great her own seen old Lang Syne, "'and surely I'll be your kind stoop, as surely I'll be mine.' And we'll taste a cup of kindness yet for old Lang Syne. Scotch! Scotch! cried Paulina. Papa is talking Scotch, and Scotch he is partly. We are home and de Bassompierre, Caledonian and Gallic. And is that a Scotch reel you are dancing, you Highland fairy? asked her father. 
Mrs. Breton, there will be a green ring growing up in the middle of your kitchen shortly. I would not answer for her being quite canny. She is a strange little mortal. Tell Lucy to dance with me, Papa. There is Lucy Snow. Mr. Home, there was still quite as much about him of plain Mr. Home as of proud Count de Bassompierre, held his hand out to me, saying kindly, he remembered me well, and even had his own memory been less trustworthy, my name was so often on his daughter's lips, and he had listened to so many long tales about me, I should seem like an old acquaintance. Everyone now had tasted the wassail cup except Paulina, whose pas de fée ou de fantasie nobody thought of interrupting to offer so profanatory a draught, but she was not to be overlooked nor balked of her mortal privileges. "'Let me taste,' said she to Graham, as he was putting the cup on the shelf of the dresser out of her reach. Mrs. Breton and Mr. Home were now engaged in conversation. Dr. John had not been unobservant of the fairy's dance. He had watched it, and he had liked it. To say nothing of the softness and beauty of the movements, eminently grateful to his grace-loving eyes, that ease in his mother's house charmed him, for it set him at ease. Again she seemed a child for him, again almost his playmate. I wondered how he would speak to her. I had not yet seen him address her. His first words proved that the old days of little Polly had been recalled to his mind by this evening's childlike light-heartedness. "'Your ladyship wishes for the tankard?' "'I think I said so. I think I intimated as much. Couldn't consent to a step of the kind on any account. Sorry for it, but couldn't do it. "'Why?' I am quite well now. It can't break my collarbone again or dislocate my shoulder. Is it wine? No, nor dew. I don't want dew. I don't like dew. But what is it? Ale, strong ale, old October. Brewed, perhaps, when I was born. It must be curious. Is it good? Excessively good. And he took it down, administered to himself a second dose of this mighty elixir expressed in his mischievous eyes extreme contentment with the same, and solemnly replaced the cup on the shelf. "'I should like a little,' said Paulina, looking up. "'I never had any old October. Is it sweet?' "'Perilously sweet,' said Graham. She continued to look up exactly with the countenance of a child that longs for some prohibited dainty. At last the doctor relented, took it down, and indulged himself in the gratification of letting her taste from his hand. His eyes, always expressive in the revelation of pleasurable feelings, luminously and smilingly avowed that it was a gratification, and he prolonged it by so regulating the position of the cup that only a drop at a time could reach the rosy, sipping lips by which its brim was courted. "'A little more, a little more,' said she, petulantly touching his hand with her forefinger, to make him incline the cup more generously and yieldingly. It smells of spice and sugar, but I can't taste it. Your wrist is so stiff, and you are so stingy. He indulged her, whispering, however, with gravity, Don't tell my mother or Lucy. They wouldn't approve. Nor do I, said she, passing into another tone and manner as soon as she had fairly assayed the beverage, just as if it had acted upon her like some disenchanting draught, undoing the work of a wizard. I find it anything but sweet. It is bitter and hot, and takes away my breath. Your old October was only desirable while forbidden. Thank you, no more. And, with a slight bend, careless but as graceful as her dance, she glided from him and rejoined her father. I think she had spoken truth. The child of seven was in the girl of seventeen. Graham looked after her, a little baffled, a little puzzled, his eye was on her a good deal during the rest of the evening, but she did not seem to notice him. As we ascended to the drawing-room for tea, she took her father's arm. Her natural place seemed to be at his side. Her eyes and her ears were dedicated to him. He and Mrs. Breton were the chief talkers of our little party, and Paulina was their best listener, attending closely to all that was said, prompting the repetition of this or that trade or adventure. "'And where were you at such a time, Papa?' And what did you say then? And tell Mrs. Breton what happened on that occasion. Thus she drew him out. She did not again yield to any effervescence of glee. The infantine sparkle was exhaled for the night. She was soft, thoughtful, and docile. 
It was pretty to see her bid good night. Her manner to Graham was touched with dignity. In her very slight smile and quiet bow spoke the countess, and Graham could not but look grave and then responsive. I saw he hardly knew how to blend together in his ideas the dancing fairy and the delicate dame. Next day, when we were all assembled round the breakfast table, shivering and fresh from the morning's chill ablutions, Mrs. Breton pronounced a decree that nobody, who was not forced by dire necessity, should quit her house that day. Indeed, egress seemed next to impossible. The drift darkened the lower panes of the casement, and, on looking out, one saw the sky and air vexed and dim, the wind and snow in angry conflict. There was no fall now, but what had already descended was torn up from the earth, whirled round by brief shrieking gusts, and cast into a hundred fantastic forms. The countess seconded Mrs. Breton. "'Papa shall not go out,' said she, placing a seat for herself beside her father's armchair. "'I will look after him. You won't go into town, will you, papa?' "'I and no,' was the answer. "'If you and Mrs. Breton are very good to me, Polly, kind, you know, and attentive, if you pet me in a very nice manner, and make much of me, I may possibly be induced to wait an hour after breakfast, and see whether this razor-edged wind settles. But, you see, you give me no breakfast, you offer me nothing, you let me starve. Quick, please, Mrs. Breton, and pour out the coffee, entreated Paulina, whilst I take care of the Count de Bassompierre in other respects. Since he grew into a count, he has needed so much attention." She separated and prepared a roll. "'There, papa, are your pistolets charged,' said she. "'And there is some marmalade, just the same sort of marmalade we used to have at Breton, and which you said was as good as if it had been conserved in Scotland. "'And which your little ladyship used to beg for my boy. Do you remember that?' interposed Mrs. Breton. "'Have you forgotten how you would come to my elbow and touch my sleeve with the whisper?' "'Please, ma'am, something good for Graham, a little marmalade or honey or jam?' "'No, Mamma," broke in Dr. John, laughing yet reddening. "'It surely was not so. I could not have cared for these things.' "'Did he or did he not, Paulina?' "'He liked them,' asserted Paulina. "'Never blush for it, John,' said Mr. Holm encouragingly. "'I like them myself yet, and always did. And Polly showed her sense in catering for a friend's material comforts, it was I who put her into the way of such good manners, nor do I let her forget them. Polly, offer me a slice of that tongue. There, papa, but remember you are only waited upon with this assiduity, on condition of being persuadable and reconciling yourself to La Terrasse for the day. Mrs. Breton, said the Count, I want to get rid of my daughter and send her to school. Do you know of any good school? There is Lucy's place, Madam Beck's. Miss Snow is in a school? I am a teacher, I said, and was rather glad of the opportunity of saying this. For a little while I had been feeling as if placed in a false position. Mrs. Breton and her son knew my circumstances, but the Count and his daughter did not. They might choose to vary by some shades their hitherto cordial manner towards me when aware of my grade in society. I spoke then readily, but a swarm of thoughts I had not anticipated nor invoked rose dim at the words, making me sigh involuntarily. Mr. Holm did not lift his eyes from his breakfast plate for about two minutes, nor did he speak. Perhaps he had not caught the words. Perhaps he thought that on a confession of that nature, politeness would interdict comment. The Scotch are proverbially proud. And homely as was Mr. Holm in look, simple in habits and tastes, I have all along intimated that he was not without his share of the national quality. Was his a pseudo-pride? Was it real dignity? I leave the question undecided in its wide sense. Where it concerned me individually, I can only answer, then and always, he showed himself a true-hearted gentleman. By nature he was a feeler and a thinker. Over his emotions and his reflections spread a mellowing of melancholy, more than a mellowing. In trouble and bereavement it became a cloud. He did not know much about Lucy Snow. What he knew he did not very accurately comprehend. Indeed, his misconceptions of my character often made me smile. But he saw my walk in life lay rather on the shady side of the hill. He gave me credit for doing my endeavor to keep the course honestly straight. He would have helped me if he could. Having no opportunity of helping, he still wished me well. 
when he did look at me his eye was kind when he did speak his voice was benevolent yours said he is an arduous calling i wish you health and strength to win it success his fair little daughter did not take the information quite so composedly she fixed on me a pair of eyes wide with wonder almost dismay are you a teacher cried she then having paused on the unpalatable idea well i never knew what you were nor ever thought of asking for me you were always lucy snow and what am i now i could not forbear inquiring yourself of course but do you really teach here in Villette? i really do and do you like it not always and why do you go on with it her father looked at and i feared was going to check her but he only said proceed polly proceed with that catechism prove yourself the little wiseacre you are if miss snow were to blush and look confused i should have to bid you hold your tongue and you and i would sit out the present meal in some disgrace but she only smiles so push her hard multiply the cross questions well miss snow why do you go on with it chiefly i fear for the sake of the money i get not from motives of pure philanthropy polly and i were clinging to that hypothesis as the most lenient way of accounting for your eccentricity no no sir rather for the roof of shelter i am thus enabled to keep over my head and for the comfort of mind it gives me to think that while i can work for myself i am spared the pain of being a burden to anybody papa say what you will i pity lucy take up that pity miss de bassompierre take it up in both hands as you might a little callow gosling squattering out of bounds without leave put it back in the warm nest of a heart where it issued and receive in your ear this whisper if my polly ever came to know by experience the uncertain nature of this world's goods i should like her to act as lucy acts to work for herself that she might burden neither kith nor kin yes papa said she pensively and tractably but poor lucy i thought she was a rich lady and had rich friends you thought like a simpleton i never thought so when i had time to consider lucy's manner and aspect which was not often i saw she was one who had to guard and not be guarded to act and not be served and this lot has i imagine helped her to an experience for which if she live long enough to realize its full benefit she may yet bless providence but this school he pursued changing his tone from grave to gay would madame beck admit my polly do you think miss lucy i said there needed but to try madame it would soon be seen she was fond of english pupils if you sir i added will but take miss de bassompierre in your carriage this very afternoon i think i can answer for it that rosine the portress will not be very slow in answering your ring and madame i am sure will put on her best pair of gloves to come into the salon to receive you in that case responded mr home i see no sort of necessity there is for delay mrs hurst can send what she calls her young lady's things after her polly can settle down to her horn-book before night and you miss lucy i trust will not disdain to cast an occasional eye upon her and let me know from time to time how she gets on i hope you approve of the arrangement countess de bassompierre the countess hemmed and hesitated i thought said she i thought i had finished my education that only proves how much we may be mistaken in our thoughts i hold a far different opinion as most of those will who have been auditors of your profound knowledge of life this morning ah my little girl thou hast much to learn and papa ought to have taught thee more than he has done come there is nothing for it but to try madame beck and the weather seems settling and i have finished my breakfast but papa well i see an obstacle i don't at all it is enormous papa it can never be got over it is as large as you and your greatcoat and the snowdrift on the top and like that snowdrift capable of melting no it is of too too solid flesh it is just your own self miss lucy warned madame beck not to listen to any overtures about taking me because in the end it would turn out that she would have to take papa too as he is so teasing i will just tell tales about him mrs breton and all of you listen 
About five years ago, when I was twelve years old, he took it into his head that he was spoiling me, that I was growing unfitted for the world, and I don't know what, and nothing would serve or satisfy him but I must go to school. I cried, and so on, but Monsieur de Bassompierre proved hard-hearted, quite firm and flinty, and to school I went. What was the result? In the most admirable manner, Papa came to school likewise. Every other day he called to see me. Madame Aigredoux grumbled, but it was of no use, and so at last Papa and I were both, in a manner, expelled. Lucy can just tell Madame Beck this little trait. It is only fair to let her know what she has to expect. Mrs. Breton asked Mr. Home what he had to say in answer to this statement. As he made no defense, judgment was given against him, and Paulina triumphed. But she had other moods besides the arch and the naive. After breakfast, when the two elders withdrew, I supposed to talk over certain of Mrs. Breton's business matters, and the Countess, Dr. Breton, and I were, for a short time, alone together. All the child left her. With us, more nearly her companions in age, she rose at once to the little lady. Her very face seemed to alter. That play of feature and candor of look which, when she spoke to her father, made it quite dimpled and round, yielded to an aspect more thoughtful, and lines distincter and less mobile. No doubt Graham noted the change as well as I. He stood for some minutes near the window, looking out at the snow. Presently he approached the hearth and entered into conversation, but not quite with his usual ease. Fit topics did not seem to rise to his lips. He chose them fastidiously, hesitatingly, and, consequently, infelicitously. He spoke vaguely of Villette, its inhabitants, its notable sites and buildings. He was answered by Miss de Bassompierre in quite womanly sort, with intelligence, with a manner not indeed wholly disindividualized. A tone, a glance, a gesture, here and there, rather animated and quick than measured and stately, still recalled little Polly, but yet there was so fine and even a polish, so calm and courteous a grace, gilding and sustaining these peculiarities, that a less sensitive man than Graham would not have ventured to seize upon them as vantage points leading to franker intimacy. Yet while Dr. Breton continued subdued, and, for him, sedate, he was still observant. Not one of those pretty impulses and natural breaks escaped him. He did not miss one characteristic movement— one hesitation in language, or one lisp in utterance. At times, in speaking fast, she still lisped, but colored whenever such lapse occurred, and in a painstaking, conscientious manner, quite as amusing as the slight error, repeated the word more distinctly. Whenever she did this, Dr. Breton smiled. Gradually, as they conversed, the restraint on each side slackened, might the conference have but been prolonged, I believe it would soon have become genial. Already to Paulina's lip and cheek returned the wreathing, dimpling smile. She lisped once, and forgot to correct herself. And Dr. John, I know not how he changed, but changed he did. He did not grow gayer, no raillery, no levity sparkled across his aspect, but his position seemed to become one of more pleasure to himself and he spoke his augmented comfort in readier language, in tones more suave. Ten years ago this pair had always found abundance to say to each other. The intervening decade had not narrowed the experience or impoverished the intelligence of either. Besides, there are certain natures of which the mutual influence is such that the more they say, the more they have to say. For these, out of association grows adhesion, and out of adhesion, amalgamation. Graham, however, must go. His was a profession whose claims are neither to be ignored nor deferred. He left the room, but before he could leave the house there was a return. I am sure he came back, not for the paper or a card in his desk which formed his ostensible errand, but to assure himself, by one more glance, that Paulina's aspect was really such as memory was bearing away that he had not been viewing her somehow by a partial artificial light, and making a fond mistake. No, he found his impression true. Rather, indeed, he gained than lost by this return. He took away with him a parting look, shy but very soft. 
as beautiful, as innocent, as any little fawn could lift out of its cover of fern, or any lamb from its meadow bed. Being left alone, Paulina and I kept silence for some time. We both took out some work, and plied a mute and diligent task. The white wood workbox of old days was now replaced by one inlaid with precious mosaic, and furnished with implements of gold. The tiny and trembling fingers that could scarce guide the needle, though tiny still, were now swift and skillful. But there was the same busy knitting of the brow, the same little dainty mannerisms, the same quick turns and movements, now to replace a stray tress, and anon to shake from the silken shirt some imaginary atom of dust, some clinging fibre of thread. That morning I was disposed for silence, the austere fury of the winter day had on me an awing, hushing influence. That passion of January, so white and so bloodless, was not yet spent. The storm had raved itself hoarse, but seemed no nearer exhaustion. Had Ginevra Fanshawe been my companion in that morning room, she would not have suffered me to muse and listen undisturbed. The presence just gone from us would have been her theme, and how she would have wrung the changes on one topic, how she would have pursued and pestered me with questions and surmises, worried and oppressed me with comments and confidences I did not want, and longed to avoid. Paulina Mary cast once or twice towards me in a quiet but penetrating glance of her dark, full eye, her lips half opened as if to the impulse of coming utterance but she saw and delicately respected my inclination for silence. This will not hold long, I thought to myself, for I was not accustomed to find in women or girls any power of self-control or strength of self-denial. As far as I knew them, the chance of a gossip about their usually trivial secrets, their often very washy and paltry feelings, was a treat not to be readily foregone. The little countess promised an exception. She sewed till she was tired of sewing, and then she took a book. As chance would have it, she had sought it in Dr. Breton's own compartment of the bookcase, and it proved to be an old Breton book, some illustrated work of natural history. Often had I seen her standing at Graham's side, resting that volume on his knee, and reading to his tuition. And when the lesson was over, begging as a treat that he would tell her all about the pictures. I watched her keenly. Here was a true test of that memory she had boasted. Would her recollections now be faithful? Faithful? It could not be doubted. As she turned the leaves over her face past gleam after gleam of expression, the least intelligent of which was a full greeting to the past. And then she turned to the title page and looked at the name written in the schoolboy hand. She looked at it long, nor was she satisfied with merely looking. She gently passed over the characters the tips of her fingers, accompanying the action with an unconscious but tender smile, which converted the touch into a caress. Paulina loved the past, but the peculiarity of this little scene was that she said nothing. She could feel without pouring out her feelings in a flux of words. She now occupied herself at the bookcase for nearly an hour, taking down volume after volume, and renewing her acquaintance with each. This done, she seated herself on a low stool, rested her cheek on her hand, and thought, and still was mute. The sound of the front door opened below, a rush of cold wind, and her father's voice speaking to Mrs. Breton in the hall startled her at last. She sprang up. She was downstairs in one second. "'Papa! Papa! You are not going out!' "'My pet, I must go into town. "'But it is too, too cold, papa.' "'And then I heard Monsieur de Bassompierre "'showing to her how he was well provided against the weather, "'and how he was going to have the carriage "'and to be quite snugly sheltered, "'and, in short, proving that she need not fear for his comfort. "'But you will promise to come back here this evening "'before it is quite dark, "'you and Dr. Breton both in the carriage. "'It is not fit to ride.' "'Well, if I see the doctor, I will tell him a lady has laid on him her commands "'to take care of his precious health, and come home early under my escort. "'Yes, you must say, a lady, and he will think it is his mother, and be obedient. "'And, papa, mind to come soon, for I shall watch and listen.' "'The door closed, and the carriage rolled softly through the snow, "'and back returned the countess, pensive and anxious.' 
She did listen and watch when evening closed, but it was in still a sort, walking the drawing-room with quite noiseless step. She checked at intervals her velvet march, inclined her ear, and consulted the night sounds. I should rather say the night silence, for now at last the wind was fallen. The sky, relieved of its avalanche, lay naked and pale. Through the barren boughs of the avenue we could see it well, and note also the polar splendor of the new year moon, an orb white as a world of ice. Nor was it late when we saw also the return of the carriage. Paulina had no dance of welcome for this evening. It was with a sort of gravity that she took immediate possession of her father as he entered the room, but she at once made him her entire property, led him to the seat of her choice, and, while softly showering round him honeyed words of commendation for being so good and coming home so soon, you would have thought it was entirely by the power of her little hands he was put into his chair and settled and arranged, for the strong man seemed to take pleasure in wholly yielding himself to this dominion, potent only by love. Graham did not appear till some minutes after the count. Paulina half turned when his step was heard. They spoke, but only a word or two. Their fingers met a moment, but obviously with slight contact. Paulina remained beside her father. Graham threw himself into a seat on the other side of the room. It was well that Mrs. Breton and Mr. Holm had a great deal to say to each other, almost an inexhaustible fund of discourse in old recollections. Otherwise, I think, our party would have been but a still one that evening. After tea, Paulina's quick needle and pretty golden thimble were busily plied by the lamplight, but her tongue rested, and her eyes seemed reluctant to raise often their lids so smooth and so full-fringed. Graham, too, must have been tired with his day's work. He listened dutifully to his elders and betters, said very little himself, and followed with his eye the gilded glance of Paulina's thimble, as if it had been some bright moth on the wing or the golden head of some darting little yellow serpent. End of chapter 25LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded in New South Wales, Australia, August 2006. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 26. A Burial. From this date my life did not want variety. I went out a good deal with the entire consent of Madame Beck, who perfectly approved the grade of my acquaintance. That worthy directress had never from the first treated me otherwise than with respect, and when she found that I was liable to frequent invitations from a chateau and a great hotel, respect improved into distinction. Not that she was fulsome about it. Madame, in all things worldly, was in nothing weak. There was measure and sense in her hottest pursuit of self-interest, calm and considerateness in her closest clutch of gain. Without then laying herself open to my contempt as a time-server and a toady, she marked with tact that she was pleased people connected with her establishment should frequent such associates as must cultivate and elevate, rather than those who might deteriorate and depress. She never praised either me or my friends. Only once, when she was sitting in the sun in the garden, a cup of coffee at her elbow and the gazette in her hand, looking very comfortable, and I came up and asked leave of absence for the evening, she delivered herself in this gracious sort. Oui, oui, ma bonne amie, je vous donne la permission de cœur et de gré. Votre travail dans ma maison a toujours été admirable, rempli de zèle et de discrétion. Vous avez bien le droit de vous amuser. Sautez donc tant que vous voudrez. Quant à votre choix de connaissance, j'en suis contente. C'est sage, digne, laudable. She closed her lips and resumed the gazette. The reader will not too gravely regard the little circumstance that about this time the triply enclosed packet of five letters temporarily disappeared from my bureau. Blank dismay was naturally my first sensation on making the discovery, but in a moment I took heart of grace. Patience, I whispered to myself, let me say nothing, but wait peaceably. 
they will come back again. And they did come back. They had only been on a short visit to Madame's chamber. Having passed their examination, they came back duly and truly. I found them all right the next day. I wonder what she thought of my correspondence. What estimate did she form of Dr. John Breton's epistolary powers? In what light did the often very pithy thoughts, the generally sound and sometimes original opinions set, without pretension, in an easily flowing spirited style, appear to her? How did she like that genial, half-humorous vein, which gave me such delight? What did she think of the few kind words scattered here and there, not thickly as the diamonds were scattered in the valley of Sinbad, but sparely as those gems lie in unfabled beds? Oh, Madame Beck, how seemed these things to you? I think in Madame Beck's eyes the five letters found a certain favour. One day, after she had borrowed them of me, in speaking of so suave a little woman one ought to use suave terms, I caught her examining me with a steady, contemplative gaze, a little puzzled, but not at all malevolent. It was during that brief space between lessons, when the pupils turned out into the court for a quarter of an hour's recreation, she and I remained in the first class alone. When I met her eye, her thoughts forced themselves partially through her lips. "'Il y a,' said she, "'quelque chose de bien remarquable dans le caractère anglais.' "'How, madame?' She gave a little laugh, repeating the word "how" in English. "'Je ne saurais vous dire how, mais enfin, les Anglais ont des idées à eux, en amitié, en amour, en tout. Mais au moins, il n'est pas besoin de les surveiller, she added, getting up and trotting away like the compact little pony she was. Then I hope, murmured I to myself, you will graciously let alone my letters for the future. Alas, something came rushing into my eyes, dimming utterly their vision, blocking from sight the schoolroom, the garden, the bright winter sun, as I remembered that never more would letters, such as she had read, come to me. I had seen the last of them. That goodly river on whose banks I had sojourned, of whose waves a few reviving drops had trickled to my lips, was bending to another course. It was leaving my little hut and field forlorn and sand dry, pouring its wealth of waters far away. The change was right, just, natural. Not a word could be said, but I loved my Rhine, my Nile. I had almost worshipped my Ganges, and I grieved that the grand tide should roll estranged, should vanish like a false mirage. Though stoical, I was not quite a stoic. Drops streamed fast on my hands, on my desk. I wept one sultry shower, heavy and brief. But soon I said to myself, The hope I am bemoaning suffered and made me suffer much. It did not die till it was full time. Following an agony so lingering, death ought to be welcome. Welcomed I endeavoured to make it. Indeed, long pain had made patience a habit. In the end I closed the eyes of my dead, covered its face, and composed its limbs with great calm. The letters, however, must be put away, out of sight. People who have undergone bereavement always jealously gather together and lock away mementos. It is not supportable to be stabbed in the heart each moment by sharp revival of regret. One vacant holiday afternoon, the Thursday, going to my treasure, with intent to consider its final disposal, I perceived, and this time with a strong impulse of displeasure, that it had been again tampered with. The packet was there indeed, but the ribbon which secured it had been untied and retied, and by other symptoms I knew that my drawer had been visited. This was a little too much. Madame Beck herself was the soul of discretion. Besides having as strong a brain and sound a judgment as ever furnished a human head, that she should know the contents of my casket was not pleasant, but might be borne. Little Jesuit inquistress as she was, she could see things in a true light and understand them in an unperverted sense. But the idea that she had ventured to communicate information thus gained to others— that she had perhaps amused herself with a companion over documents, in my eyes most sacred, shocked me cruelly. Yet such was the case I now saw reason to fear. I even guessed her confidant. Her kinsman, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, had spent yesterday evening with her. She was much in the habit of consulting him, and of discussing with him matters she broached to no one else. This very morning, in class, that gentleman had favoured me with a glance which he seemed to have borrowed from Vashti, the actress. 
I had not at the moment comprehended that blue, let lurid flash out of his angry eye, but I read its meaning now. He, I believed, was not apt to regard what concerned me from a fair point of view, nor to judge me with tolerance and candour. I had always found him severe and suspicious. The thought that these letters, mere friendly letters as they were, had fallen once and might fall again into his hands, jarred my very soul. What should I do to prevent this? In what corner of this strange house was it possible to find security or secrecy? Where could a key be a safeguard, or a padlock a barrier? In the grenier? No, I did not like the grenier. Besides, most of the boxes and drawers there were mouldering, and did not lock. Rats, too, gnawed their way through the decayed wood, and mice made nests amongst the litter of their contents. My dear letters, most dear still, though Ichabod was written on their covers, might be consumed by vermin. Certainly the writing would soon become obliterated by damp. No, the grenier would not do. But where, then? While pondering this problem, I sat in the dormitory window-seat. It was a fine frosty afternoon. The winter sun, already setting, gleamed pale on the tops of the garden shrubs in the Allée Défendue. One great old pear-tree, the nun's pear-tree, stood up a tall dryad skeleton, grey, gaunt, and stripped. A thought struck me, one of those queer, fantastic thoughts that will sometimes strike solitary people. I put on my bonnet, cloak, and furs, and went out into the city. Bending my steps to the old historical quarter of the town, whose hoax and overshadowed precincts I always sought by instinct in melancholy moods, I wandered on from street to street, till, having crossed a half-deserted place or square, I found myself before a sort of broker's shop, an ancient place full of ancient things. What I wanted was a metal box which might be soldered, or a thick glass jar or bottle which might be stoppered or sealed hermetically. Amongst miscellaneous heaps I found and purchased the latter article. I then made a little roll of my letters, wrapped them in oiled silk, bound them with twine, and, having put them in the bottle, got the old Jew-broker to stopper, seal, and make it airtight. While obeying my directions he glanced at me now and then suspiciously from under his frost-white eyelashes. I believe he thought there was some evil deed on hand. In all this I had a dreary something, not pleasure— but a sad, lonely satisfaction. The impulse under which I acted, the mood controlling me, was similar to the impulse and the mood which had induced me to visit the confessional. With quick walking I regained the pensionnat just at dark, and in time for dinner. At seven o'clock the moon rose. At half-past seven, when the pupils and teachers were at study, and Madame Beck was with her mother and children in the salle à manger, when the half-boarders were all gone home, and Rosine had left the vestibule and all was still, I shawled myself, and, taking the sealed jar, stole out through the first-class door into the berceau, and thence into the Allée Défendue. Methuselah the pear-tree stood at the further end of this walk, near my seat. He rose up, dim and grey, above the lower shrubs around him. Now Methuselah, though so very old, was of sound timber still. Only there was a hole, or rather a deep hollow, near his root. I knew there was such a hollow, hidden partly by ivy and creepers growing thick round, and there I meditated hiding my treasure. But I was not only going to hide a treasure, I also meant to bury a grief. That grief over which I had lately been weeping, as I wrapped it in its winding-sheet, must be interred. Well, I cleared away the ivy and found the hole. It was large enough to receive the jar, and I thrust it deep in. In a tool-shed at the bottom of the garden lay the relics of building materials, left off by masons lately employed to repair a part of the premises. I fetched thence a slate and some mortar, put the slate on the hollow, secured it with cement, covered the hole with black mould, and finally replaced the ivy. This done I rested, leaning against the tree, lingering like any other mourner beside a newly sodded grave. The air of the night was very still, but dim with a peculiar mist which changed the moonlight into a luminous haze. In this air, or this mist, there was some quality, electrical perhaps, which acted in strange sort upon me. I felt then, as I had felt a year ago in England, on a night when the aurora borealis was streaming and sweeping round heaven, when, belated in lonely fields, I had paused to watch that mustering of an army with banners, that quivering of serried lances, that swift descent of messengers from below the north star to the dark high keystone of heaven's arch. I felt, 
not happy, far otherwise, but strong, with reinforced strength. If life be a war, it seemed my destiny to conduct it single-handed. I pondered now how to break up my winter quarters, to leave an encampment where food and forage failed. Perhaps, to effect this change, another pitched battle must be fought with fortune. If so, I had a mind to the encounter. Too poor to lose, God might destine me to gain. But what road was open? What plan available? On this question I was still pausing, when the moon, so dim hitherto, seemed to shine out somewhat brighter. A ray gleamed even white before me, and a shadow became distinct and marked. I looked more narrowly to make out the cause of this well-defined contrast appearing a little suddenly in the obscure alley. Whiter and blacker it grew on my eye. It took shape with instantaneous transformation. I stood about three yards from a tall, sable-robed, snowy-veiled woman. Five minutes passed. I neither fled nor shrieked. She was there still. I spoke. "'Who are you? And why do you come to me?' She stood mute. She had no face, no features. All below her brow was masked with a white cloth. But she had eyes, and they viewed me. I felt, if not brave, yet a little desperate. And desperation will often suffice to fill the post, and do the work of courage. I advanced one step. I stretched out my hand, for I meant to touch her. She seemed to recede. I drew nearer. Her recession, still silent, became swift. A mass of shrubs, full-leaved evergreens, laurel and dense yew, intervened between me and what I followed. Having passed that obstacle, I looked and saw nothing. I waited. I said, "'If you have any errand to men, come back and deliver it.' Nothing spoke or reappeared. This time there was no Dr. John to whom to have recourse. There was no one to whom I dared whisper the words— I have again seen the nun. Paulina Mary sought my frequent presence in the Rue Crécy. In the old Breton days, though she had never professed herself fond of me, my society had soon become to her a sort of unconscious necessary. I used to notice that if I withdrew to my room she would speedily come trotting after me, and, opening the door and peeping in, say with her little peremptory accent, "'Come down! Why do you sit here by yourself? You must come into the parlour. In the same spirit she urged me now. "'Leave the Rue Fossette,' she said, "'and come and live with us. Papa would give you far more than Madame Beck gives you.' Mr. Home himself offered me a handsome sum, thrice my present salary, if I would accept the office of companion to his daughter. I declined. I think I should have declined had I been poorer than I was, and with scantier fund of resource, more stinted narrowness of future prospect. I had not that vocation.' I could teach, I could give lessons, but to be either a private governess or a companion was unnatural to me. Rather than fill the former post in any great house, I would deliberately have taken a housemaid's place, bought a strong pair of gloves, swept bedrooms and staircases, and cleaned stoves and locks, in peace and independence. Rather than be a companion, I would have made shirts and starved. I was no bright lady's shadow, not Mr. Bassompierre's. Overcast enough it was my nature often to be, of a subdued habit I was, but the dimness and depression must both be voluntary, such as kept me docile at my desk, in the midst of my now well-accustomed pupils in Madame Beck's first class, or alone at my own bedside, in her dormitory, or in the alley and seat which were called mine in her garden. My qualifications were not convertible nor adaptable. They could not be made the foil of any gem, the adjunct of any beauty, the appendage of any greatness in Christendom. Madame Beck and I, without assimilating, understood each other well. I was not her companion, nor her children's governess. She left me free. She tied me to nothing, not to herself, not even to her interests. Once, when she had for a fortnight been called from home by a near relation's illness, and, on her return, all anxious and full of care about her establishment, lest something in her absence should have gone wrong, finding that matters had proceeded more than usual, and that there was no evidence of glaring neglect, she made each of the teachers a present, an acknowledgment of steadiness. To my bedside she came at twelve o'clock at night, and told me she had no present for me. "'I must make fidelity advantageous to the St. Pierre,' said she. If I attempt to make it advantageous to you, there will arise misunderstanding between us. 
perhaps separation. One thing, however, I can do to please you. Leave you alone with your liberty. C'est ce que je ferai. She kept her word. Every slight shackle she had ever laid on me, she from that time with quiet hand removed. Thus I had pleasure in voluntarily respecting her rules. Gratification in devoting double time, in taking double pains with the pupils she committed to my charge. As to Mary de Bassompierre, I visited her with pleasure, though I would not live with her. My visit soon taught me that it was unlikely even my occasional and voluntary society would long be indispensable to her. Monsieur de Bassompierre, for his part, seemed impervious to this conjecture, blind to this possibility, unconscious as any child to the signs, the likelihoods, the fitful beginnings of what, when it drew to an end, he might not approve. Whether or not he would cordially approve, I used to speculate. Difficult to say. He was much taken up with scientific interests, keen, intent, and somewhat opugnant in what concerned his favourite pursuits, but unsuspicious and trustful in the ordinary affairs of life. From all I could gather, he seemed to regard his daughterling as still but a child, and probably had not yet admitted the notion that others might look on her in a different light. He would speak of what should be done when Polly was a woman, when she should be grown up, and Polly, standing beside his chair, would sometimes smile, and take his honoured head between her little hands, and kiss his iron-grey locks, and at other times she would pout and toss her curls, but she never said, Papa, I am grown up. She had different moods for different people. With her father she really was still a child, or childlike, affectionate, merry, and playful. With me she was serious and as womanly as thought and feeling could make her. With Mrs. Breton she was docile and reliant, but not expansive. With Graham she was shy, at present very shy. At moments she tried to be cold. On occasion she endeavoured to shun him. His step made her start. His entrance hushed her. When he spoke, her answers failed of fluency. When he took leave, she remained self-vexed and disconcerted. Even her father noticed this demeanour in her. "'My little Polly,' he said once, "'you live too retired a life. If you grow to be a woman with these shy manners, you will hardly be fitted for society. You really make quite a stranger of Dr. Breton. How is this? Don't you remember that, as a little girl, you used to be rather partial to him?' "'Rather, Papa,' echoed she, with her slightly dry yet gentle and simple tone. "'And you don't like him now? What has he done?' "'Nothing. Y yes, I like him a little, but we are grown strange to each other.' "'Then rub it off, Polly. Rub the rust and the strangeness off. Talk away when he is here, and have no fear of him.' "'He does not talk much. Is he afraid of me, do you think, Papa?' "'Oh, to be sure, what man would not be afraid of such a little silent lady?' "'Then tell him some day not to mind my being silent. "'Say that it is my way, and that I have no unfriendly intention.' "'Your way, you little chatterbox? "'So far from being your way, it is only your whim. "'Well, I'll improve, Papa.' "'And very pretty was the grace with which, the next day, she tried to keep her word. "'I saw her make the effort to converse affably with Dr. John on general topics. "'The attention called into her guest's face a pleasurable glow. "'He met her with caution.' and replied to her in his softest tones, as if there was a kind of gossamer happiness hanging in the air which he feared to disturb by drawing too deep a breath. Certainly, in her timid yet earnest advance to friendship, it could not be denied that there was a most exquisite and fairy charm. When the doctor was gone, she approached her father's chair. "'Did I keep my word, papa? Did I behave better?' "'My Polly behaved like a queen. I shall become quite proud of her if this improvement continues.' "'By and by we shall see her receiving my guests with quite a calm, grand manner. "'Miss Lucy and I will have to look about us, "'and polish up all our best airs and graces, lest we should be thrown into the shade. "'Still, Polly, there is a little flutter, "'a little tendency to stammer now and then, even to lisp, "'as you lisp when you were six years old.' "'No, Papa,' interrupted she indignantly. "'That can't be true.' "'I appeal to Miss Lucy.' Did she not, in answering Dr. Breton's questions as to whether she had ever seen the palace of the Prince of Boiletin, say, yes, when she had been there, several times? Papa, you are satirical, you are méchant. I can pronounce all the letters of the alphabet as clearly as you can. But tell me this, you are very particular in making me be civil to Dr. Breton. Do you like him yourself? 
"'To be sure, for old acquaintance' sake I like him. "'Then he is a very good son to his mother, "'besides being a kind-hearted fellow and clever in his profession. "'Yes, the Callant is well enough.' "'Callant! Ah, oh, Scotchman! "'Papa, is it the Edinburgh or the Aberdeen accent you have?' "'Both, my pet, both, and doubtless the Glaswegian into the bargain. "'It is that which enables me to speak French so well. "'A good Scots tongue always succeeds well at the French.' "'The French! Scotch again! Incorrigible, Papa! You too need schooling!' "'Well, Polly, you must persuade Miss Snow to undertake both you and me, to make you steady and womanly, and me refined and classical.' The light in which Monsieur de Bassompierre evidently regarded Miss Snow used to occasion me much inward edification. What contradictory attributes of character we sometimes find described to us, according to the eye with which we are viewed!' Madame Beck esteemed me learned and blue, Miss Fanshawe caustic, ironic, and cynical, Mr. Home a model teacher, the essence of the sedate and discreet, somewhat conventional, perhaps, too strict, limited, and scrupulous, but still the pink and pattern of governess correctness, whilst another person, Professor Paul Emmanuel, to wit, never lost an opportunity of intimating his opinion that mine was a rather fiery and rash nature, adventurous, indocile, and audacious. I smiled at them all. If any one knew me, it was little Paulina Mary. As I would not be Paulina's nominal and paid companion, genial and harmonious as I began to find her intercourse, she persuaded me to join her in some study, as a regular and settled means of sustaining communication. She proposed the German language, which, like myself, she found difficult of mastery. We agreed to take our lessons in the Rue Crecy of the same mistress, this arrangement threw us together for some hours of every week. Monsieur Le Bassompierre seemed quite pleased. It perfectly met his approbation. That Madame Minerva Gravity should associate a portion of her leisure with that of his fair and dear child. The other self-elected judge of mine, the professor in the Rue Fossette, discovering by some surreptitious spying means that I was no longer so stationary as hitherto, but went out regularly at certain hours of certain days, took it upon himself to place me under surveillance. People said Monsieur Emmanuel had been brought up amongst Jesuits. I should more readily have accredited this report had his manoeuvres been better masked. As it was, I doubted it. Never was a more undisguised schemer, a franker, looser intriguer. He would analyse his own machinations, elaborately contrive plots, and forthwith indulge in explanatory boasts of their skill. I know not whether I was more amused or provoked by his stepping up to me one morning, and whispering solemnly that he had his eye on me. He, at least, would discharge the duty of a friend, and not leave me entirely to my own devices. My proceedings seemed at present very unsettled. He did not know what to make of them. He thought his cousin Beck very much to blame in suffering this sort of fluttering inconsistency in a teacher attached to her house. What had a person devoted to a serious calling, that of education, to do with counts and countesses, hotels and chateaux? To him I seemed altogether en l'air. On his faith he believed I went out six days in the seven. I said, Monsieur exaggerated, I certainly had enjoyed the advantage of a little change lately, but not before it had become necessary, and the privilege was by no means exercised in excess. Necessary? How was it necessary? I was well enough, he supposed. Change necessary? He would recommend me to look at the Catholic religieuses and study their lives. They asked no change. I am no judge of what expression crossed my face when he thus spoke, but it was one which provoked him. He accused me of being reckless, worldly and epicurean, ambitious of greatness and feverishly athirst for the pomps and vanities of life. It seems I had no dévouement, no recueillement in my character. No spirit of grace, faith, sacrifice, or self-abasement. Feeling the inutility of answering these charges, I mutely continued the correction of a pile of English exercises. He could see in me nothing Christian. Like many other Protestants, I revelled in the pride and self-will of paganism. I slightly turned from him, nestling still closer under the wing of silence. A vague sound grumbled between his teeth. It could not surely be a juron. He was too religious for that but I am certain I heard the word sacré. Grievous to relate, the same word was repeated, with the unequivocal addition of mille something, when I passed him about two hours afterwards in the corridor, prepared to go and take my German lesson in the Rue Crecy. 
Never was a better little man in some points than Monsieur Paul. Never in others a more waspish little despot. Our German mistress, Fräulein Anna Braun, was a worthy, hearty woman of about forty-five. She ought perhaps to have lived in the days of Queen Elizabeth, as she habitually consumed for her first and second breakfasts beer and beef. Also her direct and downright Deutsch nature seemed to suffer a sensation of cruel restraint from what she called our English reserve. Though we thought we were very cordial with her, but we did not slap her on the shoulder, and if we consented to kiss her cheek it was done quietly, and without any explosive smack. These omissions oppressed and depressed her considerably. Still, on the whole, we got on very well. Accustomed to instruct foreign girls, who hardly ever will think and study for themselves, who have no idea of grappling with a difficulty and overcoming it by dint of reflection or application, our progress, which in truth was very leisurely, seemed to astound her. In her eyes we were a pair of glacial prodigies, cold, proud, and preternatural. The young countess was a little proud, a little fastidious, and perhaps with her native delicacy and beauty she had a right to these feelings. But I think it was a total mistake to ascribe them to me. I never evaded the morning salute which Paulina would slip when she could, nor was a certain little manner of still disdain a weapon known in my armoury of defence, whereas Paulina always kept it clear, fine, and bright, and any rough German sally called forth at once its steely glisten. Honest Anna Braun, in some measure, felt this difference, and while she half feared, half worshipped Paulina, as a sort of dainty nymph, and Eudine, she took refuge with me, as a being all mortal and of easier mood. A book we liked well to read and translate was Schiller's Ballads. Paulina soon learned to read them beautifully. The Fräulein would listen to her with a broad smile of pleasure, and say her voice sounded like music. She translated them, too, with a facile flow of language, and with a strain of kindred and poetic fervour. Her cheek would flush, her lips tremblingly smile, her beauteous eyes kindle or melt as she went on. She learned the best by heart, and would often recite them when we were alone together. One she liked well was Des Menschens Klager, that is, she liked well to repeat the words, she found plaintive melody in the sound, the sense she would criticise. She murmured as we sat over the fire one evening, Du Helige, rufe dein Kind zurück, ich habe genossen der irischke Glück, ich habe gelebt und geliebt. Lived and loved, said she. Is that the summit of earthly happiness, the end of life, to love? I don't think it is. It may be the extreme of mortal misery, it may be sheer waste of time and fruitless torture of feeling. If Schiller had said to be loved, he might have come nearer the truth. Is not that another thing, Lucy, to be loved? I suppose it may be. But why consider the subject? What is love to you? What do you know about it? She crimsoned, half in irritation, half in shame. Now, Lucy, she said, I won't take that from you. It may be well for Papa to look upon me as a baby. I rather prefer that he should thus view me. But you know and shall learn to acknowledge that I am verging on my nineteenth year. No matter if it were your twenty-ninth. We will anticipate no feelings by discussion and conversation. We will not talk about love. Indeed, indeed, said she, all in hurry and heat. You may think to check and hold me in as much as you please, but I have talked about it, and heard about it too, and a great deal and lately, and disagreeably and detrimentally, and in a way you wouldn't approve. And the vexed, triumphant, pretty, naughty being laughed. I could not discern what she meant, and I would not ask her. I was nonplussed. Seeing, however, the utmost innocence in her countenance, combined with some transient perverseness and petulance, I said at last, Who talks to you disagreeably and detrimentally on such matters? Who that has near access to you would dare to do it? Lucy, replied she more softly, it is a person who makes me miserable sometimes, and I wish she would keep away. I don't want her. But who, Paulina, can it be? You puzzle me much. It is, it is my cousin, Ginevra. Every time she has leave to visit Mrs. Cholmondeley, she calls here, and whenever she finds me alone, she begins to talk about her admirers. Love, indeed. You should hear all she has to say about love. Oh, I have heard it, said I quite coolly. And on the whole, perhaps it is as well you should have heard it too. It is not to be regretted. It is all right. Yet surely Ginevra's mind cannot influence yours. You can look over both her head and her heart. 
She does influence me very much. She has the art of disturbing my happiness and unsettling my opinions. She hurts me through the feelings and people dearest to me. What does she say, Paulina? Give me some idea. There may be counteraction of the damage done. The people I have longest and most esteemed are degraded by her. She does not spare Mrs. Breton. She does not spare Graham. No, I dare say. And how does she mix up these with her sentiment and her love? She does mix them, I suppose. Lucy, she is insolent, and, I believe, false. You know Dr. Breton. We both know him. He may be careless and proud, but when was he ever mean or slavish? Day after day she shows him to me, kneeling at her feet, pursuing her like a shadow, she repulsing him with insult, and he imploring her with infatuation. Lucy, is it true? Is any of it true? It may be true that he once thought her handsome. Does she give her out as still her suitor? She says she might marry him any day. He only waits her consent. It is these tales which have caused that reserve in your manner towards Graham which your father noticed. They have certainly made me all doubtful about his character. As Ginevra speaks, they do not carry with them the sound of unmixed truth. I believe she exaggerates, perhaps invents, but I want to know how far— Suppose we bring Miss Fanshawe to some proof. Give her an opportunity of displaying the power she boasts. I could do that to-morrow. Papa has asked some gentlemen to dinner, all savants. Graham, who, Papa is beginning to discover, is a savant too, skilled, they say, in more than one branch of science, is among the number. Now I should be miserable to sit at table, unsupported, amid such a party. I could not talk to Monsieur A. and Z., the Parisian academicians, all my new credit for manner would be put in peril. You and Mrs. Breton must come for my sake. Ginevra, at a word, will join you. Yes, then will I carry a message of invitation, and she shall have the chance of justifying her character for veracity. End of chapter 26「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 27. The Haute Crécy. The morrow turned out a more lively and busy day than we, or than I, at least, had anticipated. It seems it was the birthday of one of the young princes of La Vassecure, the eldest, I think, the Duc de Dandenon and a general holiday was given in his honour at the schools, and especially at the principal Athenay or college. The youth of that institution had also concocted, and were to present a loyal address, for which purpose they were to be assembled in the public building where the yearly examinations were conducted, and the prizes distributed. After the ceremony of presentation, an oration, or discourse, was to follow from one of the professors. Several of M. de Bassompierre's friends, the savants, being more or less connected with the Athenay, they were expected to attend on this occasion, together with the worshipful municipality of Villette, M. le Chevalier Stas, the burgomaster, and the parents and kinsfolk of the Athenians in general. M. de Bassompierre was engaged by his friends to accompany them. His fair daughter would, of course, be of the party, and she wrote a little note to Ginevra and myself, bidding us come early that we might join her. As Miss Fanshawe and I were dressing in the dormitory of the Rue Fossette, she, Miss F., suddenly burst into a laugh. "'What now?' I asked, for she had suspended the operation of arranging her attire and was gazing at me. "'It seems so odd,' she replied, with her usual half-honest, half-insolent unreserve, "'that you and I should now be so much on a level, visiting in the same sphere, having the same connections.' "'Why, yes,' said I. I had not much respect for the connections you chiefly frequented a while ago. Mrs. Chamondelet and company would never have suited me at all. "'Who are you, Miss Snow?' she inquired, in a tone of such undisguised and unsophisticated curiosity as made me laugh in my turn. "'You used to call yourself a nursery governess when you first came here. You really had the care of the children in this house. I have seen you carry little Georgette in your arms, like a bun. Few governesses would have condescended so far.' and now madame beck treats you with more courtesy than she treats the parisienne saint pierre and that proud chit my cousin makes you her bosom friend 
"'Wonderful!' I agreed, much amused at her mystification. "'Who am I indeed? Perhaps a personage in disguise. Pity I don't look the character. I wonder you are not more flattered by all this,' she went on. "'You take it with strange composure. If you really are the nobody I once thought you, you must be a cool hand.' "'The nobody you once thought me?' I repeated, and my face grew a little hot, but I would not be angry. Of what importance was a schoolgirl's crude use of the terms nobody and somebody? I confined myself, therefore, to the remark that I had merely met with civility, and asked what she saw in civility to throw the recipient into a fever of confusion. One can't help wondering at some things, she persisted. Wondering at marvels of your own manufacture. Are you ready at last? Yes. Let me take your arm. I would rather not. We will walk side by side. When she took my arm, she always leaned upon me her whole weight, and, as I was not a gentleman or her lover, I did not like it. "'There again!' she cried. "'I thought, by offering to take your arm, to intimate approbation of your dress and general appearance. I meant it as a compliment.' "'You did. You meant, in short, to express that you are not ashamed to be seen in the street with me? That if Mrs. Chamondelet should be fondling her lap-dog at some window, or Colonel de Hamel picking his teeth in a balcony, and should catch a glimpse of us, you would not quite blush for your companion?' "'Yes,' said she, with that directness which was her best point, which gave an honest plainness to her fibs when she told them, which was, in short, the salt, the sole preservative ingredient of a character otherwise not formed to keep. I delegated the trouble of commenting on this yes to my countenance, or rather, my underlip voluntarily anticipated my tongue, of course, reverence and solemnity were not the feelings expressed in the look I gave her. "'Scornful, sneering creature,' she went on, as we crossed a great square and entered the quiet, pleasant park our nearest way to the Rue Crécy. Nobody in this world was ever such a Turk to me as you are. You bring it on yourself. Let me alone. Have the sense to be quiet. I will let you alone. As if one could let you alone, when you are so peculiar and so mysterious. The mystery and peculiarity being entirely the conception of your own brain, maggots, neither more nor less, be so good as to keep them out of my sight. But are you anybody? persevered she, pushing her hand in spite of me under my arm, and that arm pressed itself with inhospitable closeness against my side by way of keeping out the intruder. Yes, I said, I am a rising character, once an old lady's companion, then a nursery governess, now a school teacher. Do, do tell me who you are. I'll not repeat it, she urged, adhering with ludicrous tenacity to the wise notion of an incognito she had got hold of, and she squeezed the arm of which she had now obtained full possession, and coaxed and conjured till I was obliged to pause in the park to laugh. Throughout our walk she rang the most fanciful changes on this theme, proving, by her obstinate credulity or incredulity, her incapacity to conceive how any person not bolstered up by birth or wealth, not supported by some consciousness of name or connection, could maintain an attitude of reasonable integrity. As for me, it quite sufficed my mental tranquillity that I was known where it imported that I known should be. The rest sat on me easily. Pedigree, social position, and recondite intellectual acquisition occupied with the same space and place in my interests and thoughts. They were my third-class lodgers, to whom could be assigned only the small sitting-room and the little back bedroom, even if the dining and drawing-room stood empty. I never confessed it to them, as thinking minor accommodations better suited to their circumstances. The world, I soon learned, held a different estimate, and I make no doubt the world is very right in its view, yet believe also that I am not quite wrong in mine. There are people whom a lowered position degrades morally, to whom loss of connection costs loss of self-respect. Are not these justified in placing the highest value on that station and association, which is their safeguard from debasement? If a man feels that he would become contemptible in his own eyes, were it generally known that his ancestry were simple and not gentle, poor and not rich, workers and not capitalists, would it be right severely to blame him for keeping these fatal facts out of sight? for starting, trembling, quailing at the chance which threatens exposure. The longer we live, the more our experience widens, the less prone are we to judge our neighbor's conduct, to question the world's wisdom. Wherever an accumulation of small defences is found, whether surrounding the prude's virtue, 
or the man of the world's respectability. There, be sure, it is needed. We reached the Hôtel Crécy. Paulina was ready. Mrs. Breton was with her, and, under her escort and that of M. de Bassompierre, we were soon conducted to the place of assembly, and seated in good seats, at a convenient distance from the tribune. The youth of the Athenée were marshalled before us, the municipality and their burgermeister were in places of honour. The young princes, with their tutors, occupied a conspicuous position, and the body of the building was crowded with the aristocracy and first burghers of the town. Concerning the identity of the professor by whom the discourse was to be delivered, I had as yet entertained neither care nor question. Some vague expectation I had that a savant would stand up and deliver a formal speech, half dogmatism to the Athenians, half flattery to the princes. The tribune was yet empty when we entered, but in ten minutes after it was filled. Suddenly, in a second of time, a head, chest, and arms grew above the crimson desk. This head I knew. Its color, shape, port, expression, were familiar both to me and Miss Fanshawe. The blackness and closeness of cranium, the amplitude and paleness of brow, the blueness and fire of glance, were details so domesticated in the memory, and so knit with many a whimsical association, as almost by their sudden apparition, to tickle fancy to a laugh. Indeed, I confess, for my part, I did laugh till I was warm, but then I bent my head and made my handkerchief, and a lowered veil, the sole confidence of my mirth. I think I was glad to see Monsieur Paul. I think it was rather pleasant than otherwise to behold him set up there, fierce and frank, dark and candid, testy and fearless, as when regnant on his estrade in class. His presence was such a surprise. I had not once thought of expecting him, though I knew he filled the chair of belles lettres in the college. With him in that tribune, I felt sure that neither formalism nor flattery would be our doom, for what was vouchsafed us, for what was poured suddenly, rapidly, continuously on our own heads, I was not prepared. He spoke to the princes, the nobles, the magistrates, and the burghers, with just the same ease, and almost the same pointed choleric earnestness, with which he was wont to harangue the three divisions of the Rue Fossette. The collegians he addressed not as schoolboys, but as future citizens and embryo patriots. The times which had since come on Europe had not been foretold yet, and M. Emmanuel's spirits seemed new to me. Who would have thought the flat and fat soil of La Basse-Cour could yield political convictions and national feelings, such as were now strongly expressed? Of the bearing of his opinions I need here give no special indication, yet it may be permitted me to say that I believe the little man was not more earnest than right in what he said. With all his fire he was severe and sensible. He trampled utopian theories under his heel. He rejected wild dreams with scorn. But he looked in the face of tyranny. Oh, then there opened a light in his eye worth seeing. And when he spoke of injustice, his voice gave no uncertain sound, but reminded me rather of the band trumpet ringing at twilight from the park. I do not think his audience were generally susceptible of sharing his flame in its purity, but some of the college youth caught fire as he eloquently told them what should be their path and endeavor in their countries and in Europe's future. They gave him long, loud, ringing cheer as he concluded. With all his fierceness, he was their favorite professor. As our party left the hall, he stood at the entrance. He saw and knew me, and lifted his hat. He offered his hand in passing, and uttered the words, Qu'en dites-vous? Question eminently characteristic, and reminded me, even in this, his moment of triumph, of that inquisitive restlessness, that absence of what I consider desirable self-control, which were amongst his faults. He should not have cared just then to ask what I thought, or what any one thought. But he did care, and he was too natural to conceal, too impulsive to repress his wish. Well, if I blamed his over-eagerness, I liked his naivete. I would have praised him. I had plenty of praise in my heart, but alas, no words on my lips. Who has words at the right moments? I stammered some lame expressions, but was truly glad when other people, coming up with profuse congratulations, covered my deficiency by their redundancy. A gentleman introduced him to Monsieur de Bassompierre, and the Count, who had likewise been highly gratified, asked him to join his friends, for the most part Monsieur Emmanuel's likewise, 
and to dine with them at the Hôtel Crécy. He declined dinner, for he was a man always somewhat shy at meeting the advances of the wealthy. There was a strength of sturdy independence in the stringing of his sinews, not obtrusive, but pleasant enough to discover as one advanced in the knowledge of his character. He promised, however, to step in with his friend, M. A., a French academician, in the course of the evening. At dinner that day, Geneva and Paulina each looked, in her own way, very beautiful. The former perhaps boasted the advantages in material charms, but the latter shone preeminent for attractions more subtle and spiritual, for light and eloquence of eyes, for grace of mien, for winning variety of expression. Ginevra's dress of deep crimson relieved well her light curls and harmonized with her rose-like bloom. Paulina's attire, in fashion close, though faultlessly neat, but in texture clear and white, made the eye grateful for the delicate life of her complexion, for the soft animation of her countenance, for the tender depth of her eyes, for the brown shadow and bounteous flow of her hair, darker than that of her Saxon cousin, as were also her eyebrows, her eyelashes, her full irids, and large mobile pupils. Nature having traced all these details slightly, and with a careless hand in Miss Fanshawe's case, and in Miss de Bassompierre's wrought them to a high and delicate finish. Paulina was awed by the savants, not quite to mutism. She conversed modestly, diffidently, not without effort, but with so true a sweetness, so fine and penetrating a sense, that her father more than once suspended his own discourse to listen, and fixed on her an eye of proud delight. It was a polite Frenchman, Monsieur Z., a very learned but quite a courtly man, who had drawn her into discourse. I was charmed with her French. It was faultless. The structure correct, the idioms true, the accent pure. Ginevra, who had lived half her life on the continent, could do nothing like it, not that words ever failed Miss Fanshawe, but real accuracy and purity she neither possessed nor in any number of years would acquire. Here, too, Monsieur de Bassompierre was gratified, for, on the point of language, he was critical. Another listener and observer was there, one who, detained by some exigency of his profession, had come in late to dinner. Both ladies were quietly scanned by Dr. Breton at the moment of taking his seat at the table, and that guarded survey was more than once renewed. His arrival roused Miss Fanshawe, who had hitherto appeared listless. She now became smiling and complacent, talked, though what she said was rarely to the purpose, or rather, was of a purpose somewhat mortifyingly below the standard of the occasion. Her light, disconnected prattle, that might have gratified Graham once, perhaps it pleased him still. Perhaps it was only fancy which suggested the thought that, while his eye was filled and his ear fed, his taste, his keen zest, his lively intelligence, were not equally consulted and regaled. It is certain that, restless and exacting as seemed the demand on his attention, he yielded courteously all that was required. His manner showed neither pique nor coolness. Ginevra was his neighbor, and to her during dinner he almost exclusively confined his notice. She appeared satisfied, and passed to the drawing-room in very good spirits. Yet no sooner had we reached that place of refuge than she again became flat and listless. Throwing herself on a couch, she denounced both the discourse and the dinner as stupid affairs, and inquired of her cousin how she could hear such a set of prosaic gros bonnets as her father gathered about him. The moment the gentlemen were heard to move, her railing ceased. She started up, flew to the piano, and dashed at it with spirit. Dr. Breton, entering, one of the first, took up his station beside her. I thought he would not long maintain that post. There was a position near the hearth to which I expected to see him attracted. This position he only scanned with his eye, while he looked, others drew in. The grace and mind of Paulina charmed these thoughtful Frenchmen. The fineness of her beauty, the soft courtesy of her manner, her immature but real and inbred tact, pleased their national taste. They clustered about her, not indeed to talk science, which would have rendered her dumb, but to touch on many subjects in letters, in arts, in actual life, on which it soon appeared that she had both read and reflected. I listened. I am sure that though Graham stood aloof, he listened too. His hearing as well as his vision was very fine, quick, discriminating. 
I knew he gathered the conversation. I felt that the mode in which it was sustained suited him exquisitely, pleased him almost to pain. In Paulina there was more force, both of feeling and character, than most people thought, than Graham himself imagined, than she would ever show to those who did not wish to see it. To speak truth, reader, there is no excellent beauty, no accomplished grace, no reliable refinement, without strength as excellent, as complete, as trustworthy. As well might you look for good fruit and blossom on a rootless and sapless tree, as for charms that will endure in a feeble and relaxed nature. For a little while the blooming semblance of beauty may flourish round weakness, but it cannot bear a blast. It soon fades, even in serenest sunshine. Graham would have started had any suggestive spirit whispered of the sinew and stamina sustaining that delicate nature. But I, who had known her as a child, knew or guessed by what a good and strong root her graces held to the firm soil of reality. While Dr. Breton listened, and waited on an opening in the magic circle, his glance restlessly sweeping the room at intervals, lighted by chance on me, where I sat in a quiet nook not far from my godmother and Monsieur de Bassompierre, who, as usual, were engaged in what Mr. Home called a two-handed crack, what the Count would have interpreted as a tete-a-tete. -tete. Graham smiled recognition, crossed the room, asked me how I was, told me I looked pale. I also had my own smile at my own thought. It was now about three months since Dr. John had spoken to me, a lapse of which he was not even conscious. He sat down and became silent. His wish was rather to look than converse. Ginevra and Paulina were now opposite to him. He could gaze his fill. He surveyed both forms, studied both faces. Several new guests, ladies as well as gentlemen, had entered the room since dinner, dropping in for the evening conversation, and amongst the gentlemen, I may incidentally observe, I had already noticed by glimpses a severe, dark, professorial outline, hovering aloof in an inner saloon, seen only in vista. Monsieur Emmanuel knew many of the gentlemen present, but I think was a stranger to most of the ladies, excepting myself. In looking towards the hearth, he could not but see me, and naturally made a movement to approach. Seeing, however, Dr. Breton also, he changed his mind and held back. If that had been all, there would have been no cause for quarrel. But not satisfied with holding back, he puckered up his eyebrows, protruded his lip, and looked so ugly that I averted my eyes from the displeasing spectacle. Monsieur Joseph Manuel had arrived, as well as his austere brother, and at this very moment was relieving Ginevra at the piano. What a master touch succeeded her schoolgirl jingle! In what grand, grateful tones the instrument acknowledged the hand of the true artist. Lucy, began Dr. Breton, breaking silence and smiling as Ginevra glided before him, casting a glance as she passed by. Miss Fanshawe is certainly a fine girl. Of course I assented. Is there, he pursued, another in the room as lovely? I think there is not another as handsome. I agree with you, Lucy. You and I do often agree in opinion, in taste, I think, or at least in judgment. Do we? I said somewhat doubtfully. I believe if you had been a boy, Lucy, instead of a girl, my mother's godson instead of her goddaughter, we should have been good friends. Our opinions would have melted into each other. He had assumed a bantering air, a light, half caressing, half ironic, shone a slant in his eye. Ah, Graham! I had given more than one solitary moment to thoughts and calculations of your estimate of Lucy Snow. Was it always kind or just? Had Lucy been intrinsically the same, but possessing the additional advantages of wealth and station, would your manner to her, your value for her, have been quite what they actually were? And yet, by these questions, I would not seriously infer blame. No. You might sadden and trouble me sometimes, but then mine was a soon depressed and easily deranged temperament. It fell if a cloud crossed the sun. Perhaps before the eye of severe equity, I should stand more at fault than you. Trying then to keep down the unreasonable pain which thrilled my heart on thus being made to feel that while Graham could devote to others the most grave and earnest, the manliest interest, he had no more than light raillery for Lucy, the friend of Langsyne, I inquired calmly, 
On what points are we so closely in accordance? We each have an observant faculty. You, perhaps, don't give me credit for the possession. Yet I have it. But you were speaking of tastes. We may see the same objects, yet estimate them differently. Let us bring it to the test. Of course, you cannot but render homage to the merits of Miss Fanshawe. Now, what do you think of others in the room? My mother, for instance, or the lions yonder, Messieurs A and Z. Or, let us say, that pale little lady, Miss de Bassompierre. You know what I think of your mother. I have not thought of Messieurs A and Z. And the other? I think she is, as you say, a pale little lady. Pale certainly just now, when she is fatigued with over-excitement. You don't remember her as a child? I wonder sometimes whether you do. I had forgotten her, but it is noticeable that circumstances, persons, even words and looks that had slipped your memory may, under certain conditions, certain aspects of your own or another's mind, revive. That is possible enough. Yet, he continued, the revival is imperfect, needs confirmation, partakes so much of the dim character of a dream, or of the airy one of a fancy, that the testimony of a witness becomes necessary for corroboration. Were you not a guest at Breton ten years ago, when Mr. Holm brought this little girl, whom we then called little Polly, to stay with Maman? I was there the night she came, and also the morning she went away. Rather peculiar child, was she not? I wonder how I treated her. Was I fond of children in those days? Was there anything gracious or kindly about me, great reckless schoolboy as I was? But you don't recollect me, of course. You have seen your own picture at La Terresse. It is like you personally. In manner, you were almost the same yesterday as today. But, Lucy, how is that? Such an oracle really whets my curiosity. What am I today? What was I the yesterday of ten years back? gracious to whatever pleased you, unkindly or cruel to nothing. There you are wrong. I think I was almost a brute to you, for instance. A brute? No, Graham. I should never have patiently endured brutality. This, however, I do remember. Quiet Lucy Snow tasted nothing of my grace. As little of your cruelty. Why, had I been Nero himself, I could not have tormented a being inoffensive as a shadow. I smiled, but I also hushed a groan. Oh, I just wished he would let me alone, cease allusion to me. These epithets, these attributes I put from me. His quiet Lucy Snow, his inoffensive shadow, I gave him back, not with scorn, but with extreme weariness. Theirs was the coldness and the pressure of lead. Let him whelm me with no such weight. Happily, he was soon on another theme. On what terms were little Polly and I? Unless my recollections deceive me, we were not foes. You speak very vaguely. Do you think little Polly's memory not more definite? Oh, we don't talk of little Polly now. Pray say Miss de Bassompierre, and of course such a stately personage as remembers nothing of Breton. Look at her large eyes, Lucy. Can they read a word in the page of memory? Are they the same which I used to direct to a horn-book? She does not know that I partly taught her to read. In the Bible on Sunday nights? She has a calm, delicate, rather fine profile now. Once what a little restless, anxious countenance was hers. What a thing is a child's preference! What a bubble! Would you believe it? That lady was fond of me. I think she was in some measure fond of you, said I moderately. You don't remember, then? I had forgotten, but I remember now. She liked me the best of whatever there was at Breton. You thought so. I quite well recall it. I wish I could tell her all I recall, or rather, I wish some one, you for instance, would go behind and whisper it all in her ear, and I could have the delight, here, as I sit, of watching her look under the intelligence. Could you manage that, think you, Lucy, and make me ever grateful? "'Could I manage to make you ever grateful?' said I. "'No, I could not.' And I felt my fingers work and my hands interlock. I felt, too, an inward courage, warm and resistant. In this matter I was not disposed to gratify Dr. John at all. Not at all. 
Now, with welcome force, I realized his entire misapprehension of my character and nature. He wanted always to give me a rule not mine. Nature and I opposed him. He did not at all guess what I felt. He did not read my eyes, or face, or gestures, though I doubt not all spoke. Leaning towards me coaxingly, he said softly, "'Do content me, Lucy.' And I would have contented, or at least I would clearly have enlightened him, and taught him well never again to expect of me the part of officious soubrette in a love-drama, when, following his soft, eager murmur, meeting almost his pleading mellow, "'Do content me, Lucy,' A sharp hiss pierced my ear on the other side. Petite chatte, doucerette, coquette, sibilated the sudden boa constrictor. Vous avez l'air bien triste, soumis, rêveur, mais vous ne l'êtes pas. C'est moi qui vous le dis, sauvage, la flamme à l'âme, l'éclair aux yeux. Oui, j'ai la flamme à l'âme, et je dois la voir, retorted I, turning in just wrath. But Professor Emanuel had hissed his insult and was gone. The worst of the matter was that Dr. Breton, whose ears, as I have said, were quick and fine, caught every word of this apostrophe. He put his handkerchief to his face and laughed till he shook. "'Well done, Lucy,' cried he. "'Capital! Petite chat! Petite coquette! Oh, I must tell my mother. Is it true, Lucy, or half true?' i believe it is you redden to the colour of miss fanshawe's gown and really by my word now i examine him that is the same little man who was so savage with you at the concert the very same and in his soul he is frantic at this moment because he sees me laughing oh i must tease him and graham yielding to his bent for mischief laughed jested and whispered on till i could bear no more and my eyes filled suddenly he was sobered a vacant space appeared near Miss de Bassompierre. The circle surrounding her seemed about to dissolve. This movement was instantly caught by Graham's eye. Ever vigilant, even while laughing, he rose, took his courage in both hands, crossed the room, and made the advantage his own. Dr. John, throughout his whole life, was a man of luck, a man of success. And why? Because he had the eye to see his opportunity, the heart to prompt to well-timed action, the nerve to consummate a perfect work. And no tyrant passion dragged him back. No enthusiasms, no foibles encumbered his way. How well he looked at this very moment! When Paulina looked up as he reached her side, her glance mingled at once with an encountering glance, animated yet modest. His color, as he spoke to her, became half a blush, half a glow. He stood in her presence, brave and bashful, subdued and unobtrusive, yet decided in his purpose and devoted in his ardor. I gathered all this by one view. I did not prolong my observation. Time failed me, had inclination served. The night wore late. Ginevra and I ought already to have been in the Rue Fossette. I rose and bade good night to my godmother and Monsieur de Bassompierre. I know not whether Professor Emmanuel had noticed my reluctant acceptance of Dr. Breton's bandinage, or whether he had perceived that I was pained, and that, on the whole, the evening had not been one flow of exultant enjoyment for the volatile, pleasure-loving Mademoiselle Lucy. But, as I was leaving the room, he stepped up and inquired whether I had any one to attend me to the Rue Fossette. The professor now spoke politely, and even deferentially, and he looked apologetic and repentant. But I could not recognize his civility at a word, nor meet his contrition with crude, premature oblivion. Never hitherto had I felt seriously disposed to resent his brusqueries, or freeze before his fierceness. What he had said to-night, however, I considered unwarranted. My extreme disapprobation of proceeding must be marked, however slightly. I merely said, I am provided with attendants which was true, as Ginevra and I were to be sent home in the carriage, and I passed him with sliding obeisance with which he was wont to be saluted in class by pupils crossing his estrade. Having sought my shawl, I returned to the vestibule. Monsieur Emmanuel stood there as if waiting. He observed that the night is fine. "'Is it?' I said, with a tone and manner whose consummate chariness and frostiness I could not but applaud. 
It was so seldom I could properly act out my own resolution to be reserved and cool where I had been grieved or hurt, that I felt almost proud of this one successful effort. That, is it, sounded just like the manner of other people. I had heard hundreds of such little minced, docked, dried phrases from the pursed-up coral lips of a score of self-possessed, self-sufficing misses and mesdemoiselles, that M. Paul would not stand any prolonged experience of this sort of dialogue I knew, but he certainly merited a sample of the curt and arid. I believe he thought so himself, for he took the dose quietly. He looked at my shawl, and objected to its lightness. I decidedly told him it was as heavy as I wished. Receding aloof and standing apart, I leaned on the banister of the stairs, folded my shawl about me, and fixed my eyes on a dreary religious painting darkening the wall. Ginevra was long in coming. Tedious seemed her loitering. Monsieur Paul was still there. My ear expected from his lips an angry tone. He came nearer. Now for another hiss, thought I. Had not the action been too uncivil, I could have stopped my ears with my fingers in terror of the thrill. Nothing happens as we expect. Listen for a coo or a murmur. It is then that you will hear a cry of prey or pain. Await a piercing shriek, an angry threat, and welcome an amicable greeting, a low kind whisper. Monsieur Paul spoke gently. Friends, said he, do not quarrel for a word. Tell me, was it I, or ce grand fat Anglaise, so he profanely denominated Dr. Breton, who made your eyes so humid, and your cheeks so hot as they are even now? I am not conscious of you, monsieur, or of any one having excited such emotion as you indicate was my answer, and in giving it I again suppressed my usual self, and achieved a neat, frosty falsehood. But what did I say, he pursued? Tell me, I was angry, and I have forgotten my words. What were they? Such as it is best to forget, said I, still quite calm and chill. Then it was my words which wounded you. Consider them unsaid. Permit my retraction. Accord my pardon. I am not angry, monsieur. Then you are worse than angry, grieved. Forgive me, Miss Lucy. Monsieur Emmanuel, I do forgive you. Then let me hear you say, in the voice natural to you, and not in that alien tone, Mon ami, je vous pardonne. He made me smile. Who could help smiling at his wistfulness, his simplicity, his earnestness? Bon, cried he. Voilà que le jeu va prendre. Dites donc, mon ami. Monsieur Paul, je vous pardonne. I will have no monsieur. Speak the other word, or I shall not believe you sincere. Another effort, mon ami, or else in English, my friend. Now, my friend had a rather another sound and significancy than mon ami. It did not breathe the same sense of domestic and intimate affection. Mon ami, I could not say to Monsieur Paul. My friend, I could, and did say without difficulty. This distinction existed not for him, however, and he was quite satisfied with the English phrase. He smiled. You should have seen him smile, reader, and you should have marked the difference between his countenance now and that he wore half an hour ago. I cannot affirm that I have ever witnessed a smile of pleasure, or content, or kindness round Monsieur Paul's lips, or in his eyes before. The ironic, the sarcastic, the disdainful, the passionately exultant. I had hundreds of times seen him express by what he called a smile, but any illuminated sign of milder or warmer feelings struck me as wholly new in his visage. It changed it as from a mask to a face. The deep lines left his features, the very complexion seemed clearer and fresher. That swart, sallow, southern darkness which spoke his Spanish blood became displaced by a lighter hue. I know not that I have ever seen in any other human face an equal metamorphosis from a similar cause. He now took me to the carriage, at the same moment Monsieur de Bassompierre came out with his niece. In a pretty humour was Mr. Fanshawe. She had found the evening a grand failure. Completely upset as to temper, she gave way to the most uncontrolled moroseness as soon as we were seated and the carriage door closed. Her invectives against Dr. Breton had something venomous in them. Having found herself impotent either to charm or sting him, hatred was her only recourse. 
and to this hatred she expressed in terms so unmeasured and proportions so monstrous, that after listening for a while with assumed stoicism, my outraged sense of justice at last suddenly caught fire. An explosion ensued, for I could be passionate too, especially with my present fair but faulty associate, who never failed to stir the worst dregs of me. It was well that the carriage-wheels made a tremendous rattle over the flinty Trusville pavement, for I can assure the reader that there was neither dead silence nor calm discussion within the vehicle. Half in earnest, half in seeming, I made it my business to storm down Ginevra. She had set out rampant from the Rue Crécy. It was necessary to tame her before we reached the Rue Fossette. To this end, it was indispensable to show up her sterling value in high deserts, and this must be done in language of which the fidelity and homeliness might challenge comparison with the compliments of a John Knox to a Mary Stuart. This was the right discipline for Ginevra. It suited her. I am quite sure that she went to bed that night all the better and more settled in mind and mood, and slept all the more sweetly for having undergone a sound moral drubbing. End of chapter 27, The Hôtel Crécy Read by Torah in Yellowstone National Park, December 2006